Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our session. It's good to see everyone, those that are coming in. Uh, why don't you put some handouts back there? There's some extra handouts here. So, what I like to do, where's my Bible? So um, what I'd like to do is uh, begin with a prayer and then go into two scriptures and then I'll tell you what we're going to do tonight, okay? So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we gather in your holy name and we ask that you be with us as we reflect upon the gift of your church. You reveal to us, Lord, that the church is a mystery and it leads us into the very life of you since you founded the church. So help us to always love and to cherish the church, to be faithful members of her, and to proclaim her to all those we may meet. And may we truly die within the bonds and the friendships of your church. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so tonight I want to do two things. So it was advertised, uh, what makes the church the four marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But I was thinking about it, and I'm like, how can I maybe turn it into something else too? So what I wanted to ask everyone is, do any of you own a catechism of the Catholic Church? Raise your hand if you own a catechism. Only a, this one? You got that one. But this is the newest version of the Catholic Catechism that came out in the mid-90s. Uh, Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, led the effort to re- issue a new catechism in light of the Second Vatican Council. I actually have a family memory of it. My dad bought the first round of those copies and for the next year he read two paragraphs of the catechism and it took him a whole year to read it. And I'm like, that must be an important book. I better read it. Uh, so I remember that witness of my dad to me. But since many of you, it looks like, have not been exposed to the catechism of the Catholic Church, what I want to do is turn it into a dual thing. We'll talk about the four marks of the church, but I want to introduce you to the actual catechism. So in case that you want to buy a catechism and actually learn more about your faith and realize that you can read this thing and you can understand it, you're smart, you got noggins on your heads and you can use your brains in order to learn more deeply about your faith. Because if you really want to learn more deeply about your faith, you should really have two books, the Bible and the catechism. That's what you should really have. And there are different versions of the catechism. Um, if this one's a little too harsh, so this is the one all the other catechisms are based off of. This is the universal catechism. It's in 80 different languages, okay? So all the other local nations in the world can make catechisms from that. Another one that they came out with is called a UCAT. It's a youth catechism. It's actually kind of like a Baltimore catechism. It has question and answer. So there are resources out there that could really kind of help you to grow in your faith. But I want to expose you to um, the catechism of the Catholic Church by going over our topic tonight, which is the four marks of the church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So do you realize that you say that every time you say the creed? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Now look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So that's the last part of it. Have you ever asked yourself this question, why do I have to believe in the church? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why do I say that I believe in the church? So since we're all together, we all know each other, I just want to ask you this question. You guys discuss it a little bit at, at your tables. When you hear the word church, what other words come to mind? One, two, three, go. When you hear the word church, what other things come to mind?
done talking already? <laughs> Just think of what any other, what, what, what other words pop into your mind? When you think of the word church, what pops into your head? Uh, pancake supper. <laughs> Fish I mean, anything that comes into your mind about church. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's have everybody bring come together. Okay, so what are some examples? When you think of the word church, what do you think of? Mass. Mass. Faith. 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 A place to worship. A building. Okay? Gathering of people. Gathering of people. God. God. What else? Unity. Unity. Okay, you got one of the four marks. All right, Laura. <laughs> we'll get you a brownie. Okay. Okay. I had one already. Okay, right. Anything else? Okay, so a lot of times when I ask that question, most people don't even mention any of the four marks. You know, most of the time you think of church, community, I would think of circles, <laughs> funeral luncheons, my, my other community in my life outside of my family. I mean, a lot of times things like that. But what, what I want to do is just look at briefly, by those four marks, you understand what we as Catholics believe the church to be. When you have those four marks present, then you have the, the church that Jesus founded. When those four elements are present, you have the church that Jesus founded. So what I want to look into, though, is what do those terms mean? And the catechism is so rich with that. But before I start with that, I want to go just a little overview about the, the Catholic catechism. So the Catholic Catechism was written in the mid-90s. It was the first catechism to be written officially by the church since the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent ended in 1565. From 1565, we had only had one catechism. And all the Baltimore catechisms that some of you remember growing up were based on the Catechism of Trent. So Baltimore was the first see or diocese in the United States. It's the premier see, it was the first diocese founded. And all the early meetings of the, of the United States bishops were all done in, in, in Baltimore. So they would have councils, local councils in Baltimore, and that's how you get the name, the Baltimore Catechism. So the fourth council of Baltimore, all the bishops came and said, we gotta put a thing together that helps people learn the faith. And that's what had gone on between the Baltimore Catechism all the way up to our present catechism that we have. Okay? So it's based on the Council of Trent Catechism in 1565. That's pretty old. So we have the Second Vatican Council, which was the biggest event in the 20th century, I think even bigger than World War II, bigger than it was the event of the, of the 20th century. And from that, we have the renewal of the Second Vatican Council. And in the mid-1990s, Pope John Paul II is like, we need a catechism to reflect what we believe now as Catholics. So that's how this book came to be. This, four, this book is organized into four pillars. And it really summarizes the way we look at our faith. So the first thing is, is the profession of faith. Or in other words, the creed. When you look at the earliest formulations of the faith, they all come from the baptismal liturgy. When, what do you ask parents well, what do you ask people when they want to become Catholic before they become baptized? And the church is like, huh? Let's look at what we ask them before they get baptized. And when you look at it, they are asked the questions, do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe in the church? Do you believe in the forgiveness of sins? Do you know when I do a baptism, I'm asking the parents and godparents that. Do you reject Satan? I do, and all his empty works, and all... That all goes back to when we were baptizing people, and that's the, the basis of the Apostles' Creed. So there are 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed after one of the Apostles. So the first part of the Catechism, and the first part of it, is the explanation of what it means, what we believe when we say the Apostles' Creed. So that's the first part, okay? The second part of the Catechism is the sacraments. Okay? The sacraments, those are the living, Encounters of the living, risen Christ that are present in the church in the seven special celebrations that we all have to memorize. Okay, everyone, let's go through the sacraments. Let's see if we can do it. Sacraments of initiation. We start with baptism, confirmation, holy Eucharist. 
sacraments of healing, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, and anointing of the sick, the sacraments of service, holy orders, and marriage. So those seven celebrations are special encounters with the grace of the risen Christ. If you want to get connected with the cross that happened 2,018 years ago, go to a sacrament. That's what you experience the grace of Christ. Without the sacraments, we do not have the grace of Christ. Okay? That's the second part of that book. Third part of the book is Life in Christ. And that deals with our moral life. What does the church teach about morals? If you claim to be a Christian, this is how your life should look like. So the third part of the catechism is the reflection on the Ten Commandments, what is a sin, what is um, a good act, what is a virtue, a reflection on the Ten Commandments, what's my relationship with my family and with society. So that's the third part of the actual catechism. Then the last pillar of the catechism is prayer. So you start with profession of faith, you reflect on the sacraments of new grace, and because of that encounter with the sacraments, you live a new life of grace in the Holy Spirit, which is the life of happiness and joy in the Holy Spirit, and that is sustained by private prayer that is nurtured by public prayer of the church. If you look at it, that's the summary of our Catholic faith. And if you read this book, it could take you a year, take you five years maybe, couple of years, or look up what you're interested in. When I was 15 years old, I was wondering, what's a sin? That's what I was wondering about, so I was looking that thing up. Oh, God. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. All right? So those four things, four pillars, make up our Catholic faith. It's the summary of where we are. If you want to know where your faith is, what the official stance of the Catholic Church, not what the New York Times tells you, not what the Gazette tells you, not what CNN tells you. You get this book and you look up that paragraph and you find what does the church actually teach. This is the beginning point. Here's my thing. Anyone who leaves the church without reading the catechism has left prematurely. You have to look at your faith before you leave your faith. So anyone who's doubting their faith, they should read the catechism, talk to a priest, and ask God to help them. That's what they really do before they leave. Okay, so there's a the little, uh, little thing about uh, that. So once you get on your sheet, and what I want to do is to look at the section. So if you look up here in the top there, you see we're in part one, the profession of faith. Section two, the creeds that we believe. See chapter three, we're within the I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then article nine, which is the ninth article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, or as the Nicene Creed calls one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So what I basically want to do is go through some of these paragraphs, have you read them, see what you think about the explanation of them. How does that sound? Then you can have a little discussion, and hopefully this leads you to want to maybe read some other parts of the catechism. I think it would be really helpful. Is that fair? Then you can take any questions, and we'll be out of here, and you can have a glass of wine when you get home. It's Easter, okay? All right. Okay. So, so let's just look at Let's look at that first paragraph, 811 there, okay? So this is the sole church of Christ, which in the creed we profess to be one holy, catholic, and apostolic. These four characteristics, inseparably linked with each other, indicate essential features of the church and her mission. The church does not possess them of herself. It is Christ who, through the Holy Spirit, makes his church one holy, catholic, and apostolic. And it is he who calls her to realize each of these qualities. So what that says right away is that the four marks of the church are gifts of Christ. This is my gift to you, the church. Do we ever consider that it's a gift to be a part of the church? I've been baptized and made a member of this church. And he says, I want to give you four marks, gifts, that will always keep the church alive. And that is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Those are ones that we are given. And then Jesus says, you have to live up to them with the help of my Holy Spirit that I give you. Remember, there are three birthdays in your life. Did you know that? The first birthday is your natural birth. The second birthday is your baptismal date. Do you know it? Do you know your baptismal date? <coughs> call, call up Denise and she'll tell you, okay? All right. And then the third date 
is Pentecost. So all of us should have three birthday cakes every year. The day you were born, the day you were baptized, and the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. Because do you remember what happens in that story? All those different people from all over the world are in Jerusalem. The apostles are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire. They start speaking and everyone understands them. It doesn't matter what language they have, when they start speaking, everybody understands them. They all think the apostles are drunk on wine, you know? That's the birth of the church. It's the undoing of the Tower of Babel. Remember that story in Genesis? How God confused all the nations of the world because of their pride, wanting to go up to God. So he dispersed them in all those different languages. Pentecost is the fulfillment of the gathering of all the nations. And that's the beginning of the church. That's the birthday of the church. So by that, when, when God sent the Holy Spirit on the church, he started a one holy Catholic and apostolic church that every single person is invited to be a part of. Just think about that. It doesn't matter where you're from, who, what your name is, what your ability is, what your weaknesses are, what your sins are. It doesn't matter any of it. If you believe in Jesus and are baptized, you are welcomed into this community called the church. That's what makes it the sacrament of salvation for the whole world. We think about that. That's pretty powerful. It started in Little Jerusalem, and it's made it all the way to Kelmer. Right? Think about that. That's a miracle in itself, that it made it all the way here, and that you and I and your families have been passing on from generation to generation. So that's one thing there. How does that work? I think that's pretty cool. If you learn that, all right, you're good. Okay? All right, let's look at the first one now. The church is one. When we say that the church is one, what does that mean? So let's kind of first talk about it among yourselves. When we use the phrase, the church is one, before looking at what the church teaches, what do you think that means? You kind of talk amongst yourselves at your table. What does it mean? One church. It's kind of a, that's a, what does that mean? can't read yet. Don't read ahead. <laughs> Don't look for the answer. What do you think? No, she This is not an open book test. Okay. Let's all come back. So let's let's take a stab. Let's do this table here first. What do you think when we say the word the church is one? What do you think that means? I think it's the same all, all over. The same all over. Okay. Okay? So you have Mass in Poland, you have Mass in Festina, you have Mass in Uruguay, you have Mass at the North Pole. Okay? All right? What do you think right here? What is the church? The church is one. What do you think that means? Take a stab at it. What do you think? One for all the people, for everybody, no matter who or what. Okay? One. Okay? All right? Let's go to this table here. So you're going to say, I agree with the previous table? <laughs> is, that, is that what the verdict of this table is? One belief. One belief. So one belief. Okay. How about this one here? I'm going to start with you on the next question. <laughs> what do you think? The church is one. One God. One God. Okay. With one God, there would be one church. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's, let's start looking at it now. Look at paragraph 813. See that there? The church is one because of her source. The highest exemplar and the source of this mystery is the unity and the trinity of persons of the one God, the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. The church is one because of her founder. For the word made flesh, the Prince of Peace, reconciled all men to God by the cross, restoring the unity of all in one people and one body. The church is one because of her soul. It is the Holy Spirit dwelling in those who believe and pervading and ruling over the entire church who brings about that wonderful communion of the faithful and joins them together so intimately in Christ that he is the principle of the church's unity. 
Unity is of the essence of the church. So think about that for just a brief moment. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. So if we have a soul in our body, so the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. Have you ever thought of that before? So the unity of God is given to the church. I think the, I think the Holy Trinity kind of gets along, don't you think? Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they kind of think they get along pretty well. Right? They're one, yet distinct. One nature, three persons. So think about the diversity of all the world that is brought into one church. That can only be done because of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. How many things do people really agree on? <laughs> Let me tell you, I go to the four towns. Wow. <laughs> Just had an experience last night. Not agree. <laughs> right? So... We are one because of who God is. Here's this wonderful quote. Look at that quote at the bottom there. And here's one thing I did in our, in our, I put all the footnotes. Footnotes are so important. There's about five footnotes in here, and it brings you to the scriptures and to the quotes of the catechism. So this, this quote is from St. Clement of Alexandria. He wrote, he, he lived in the 400s. This is what he says. What an astonishing mystery. There's one father of the universe one Logos of the universe, the Word of God, and also one Holy Spirit, everywhere one and the same. There is also one virgin become mother, and I should like to call her church. That's kind of a powerful quote. Ever thought of the church in that way? It's kind of beautiful. Okay? So if you turn the page, go to 815. What does it look like to be one? What makes us one? This is a wonderful quote here. What are, the, what are these bonds of unity? Above all, charity binds everything together in perfect harmony. So when we live love, the command of Christ's love, we experience unity. Have you ever noticed that? When you live love within the church, you always have unity. When you live pride and ambition and self-interest, you always experience division in the church. You notice that? So unity is the primary thing. It's not hierarchy or power. It's charity is the binding part of all of us, okay? So here are some other aspects of the, of the unity that we have. Profession of one faith received from the apostles, the common celebration of divine worship, especially the sacraments, apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders, maintaining the fraternal concord of God's family. And so that's another way of thinking about the church. The church is the family of God. You've got moms and dads, in a church. So that's why you call priest father. That's why we call the priest, the holy father, papa, pope, right? It's a family. So these are the bonds of unity. So when these things are not present, then the church is not one. So that's what it means when we say the church is one. The church is one. So if you go farther down there, you see that subheading wounds to unity? That's what we know so well, right? There's a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran church in this town. There is a Methodist church in this town. There's a Lutheran church in this town. And there's a Catholic church in Calvary, all in Calvary. That's not, what, that's not what Jesus wanted. He didn't want that. He wanted one church. We're all interconnected in different ways, but we're not in the full communion that Christ desires. So that's what that part, you can read it on your own, deal with the different wounds that we have. When we're at like um, the Lutheran Church and they recite yeah. their creed and they, they say we believe in one holy Catholic yep. Church. Yeah. So what does that mean? Yes. So we'll say so the, the question by Diane was if you go to a Lutheran service, a lot of times they profess the the Nicene Creed. So most mainline Protestant churches share the same Nicene Creed, one holy Catholic apostolic, one holy Catholic apostolic church. But that means something different for them. Is it Catholic universal, though? So we're going to get to that. Pat, stop giving the lesson. <laughs> right, okay. So let's just be really clear. So when you say the creed now, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I believe in one church. It's the one church that Christ founded, which we profess the faith of the apostles, 
we celebrate the sacraments and charity is the binding force among all those who profess it. That's what makes the church. <coughs> so when you say that, think about that. I am one in God and I can be one with others. And it's only because of the Holy Spirit that's been given to the church. When you say that, it's kind of powerful, right? Yeah, Steve? Was there ever just one church? Yes, there was for 1,054 years. <coughs> So if you remember when I did that, that uh, chart, the ch first split of the church was 1054 with the Eastern Orthodox. So that's why we have this effort of trying to bring the communities together. But if we've been separate for a thousand years, it may take us a thousand years to come together again. You know, We have to get over ourselves to come together. So. Okay, so we're good on that one? Okay, let's go to the church is holy. So I'm gonna throw it back to you guys now. I say the church is holy. You say the church is holy every time that you say the Nicene Creed. What does it mean when you say the church is holy? One, two, three, go. Don't read the handout. What do you yes. think it means? Stop, stop cheating. What does it mean, holy? This is a tough one for me. Church is holy. What does that mean? That's a word that came on our text. Perfect. 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 Made by God. God is holy. God, God is holy. Okay. Yep. Okay. Guess we're done with that one. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. What do you think? Living in the grace of God. Okay. So the church is holy because we're living in the grace of God. That's pretty good. Yeah. How about here? <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking? They're pointing at you. <laughs> You're pointing at her. What is another one? You learned how the Baltimore Catechism? <laughs> what does the Baltimore Catechism say? It says it is holy because it was founded by Jesus Christ, who is all holy, and because it teaches according to the will of Christ, holy doctrine, and provides the means of leading a holy life, thereby giving holy members, and gi giving holy members in every Okay, got to add the word holy one more time, right? <laughs> so actually, the Baltimore Catechism really does have a pretty good answer there, which is good. So let's look at it now. So look at H23. Look at H23 there on the bottom of page 3. Do you see it there, paragraph H23? The church, so here's this is a very, very important sentence, that first one. The church is held as a matter of faith to be unfailingly holy. So look at that phrase. It's actually a statement of belief. I believe the church is unfailingly holy. Now, that, that comes from the gift of faith. It's not self-evident. Isn't that pretty true? There's some pretty unholy things that happen in the church. So that's why it has to be a 
act of faith. I believe the church is unfailingly holy. So what does that mean then? This is because Christ, the Son of God, who with the Father and the Spirit is hailed as alone holy, loved the church as his bride, giving himself up for her so as to sanctify her. He joined her to himself as his body and endowed her with the gift of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. That's actually a quote from the scriptures, Ephesians there. So if you have your footnote, you can look that scripture up. The church then is the holy people of God and her members are called saints. You guys are saints. So you can start signing that, right? You know, ST period. So that goes to the basic of what that word means, holy ones. We are made holy ones by being baptized, by being confirmed. Do you think of yourself in that way, that you're a saint, a holy one? So what does that say? So holy comes from the word um, consecration. You know how we use the word consecration? That means to be literally set apart. So we use the word consecration a lot over the elements of bread and wine, right? So once those elements are consecrated, they cannot be used for any other use other than holy use. So that's why we put the consecrated hosts in the tabernacle. It doesn't go back into the cupboard in the sacristy. It is holy. The same with us. We are set apart. With, and that's why you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Do you think about that every day? You're a saint, a holy one. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And every individual member of the church is. The question is, is the individual member of the church living from that identity or not? The times you're sinning, you're not. The times you're responding to grace, you are. So you are a saint. That's different than a canonized saint, right? So we'll talk about that. So look at page 24 there. United with Christ, the church is sanctified by him. Through him and with him, she becomes sanctifying. Look at that phrase. That's a beautiful phrase. Through him and with him, she becomes sanctifying. She sanctifies the world. The church sanctifies the world. It makes it holy because it's connected to her founder. Okay? So look at that quote there. I love this quote. All the activities of the church are directed as toward their end to the sanctification of men in Christ and the glorification of God. That's the, that's the description of the church. That's the job of the church. If fish fries help, great. But that's not the essence of why the church exists. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that. The purpose of the church is to make saints. The purpose of St. Aloysius and Calmer, Our Lady of Seven Dollars in Festina, St. Francis de Sales in Ossian, and St. Wenceslas in Spillville, is to really make saints. That's the purpose of those four institutions. Do we ask ourselves that question enough? Are we making saints? Over the course of the years, I think we have, but we always have to go back to that's the main reason why we get up in the morning as a parish community is that the church has to make saints. Does that make sense? Am I speaking Greek? Hagias Hathias, Hagias Iskodas, Hagias Athanatas. Now I'm speaking Greek. Okay. So here's the thing. Look at H25. So H25. The church on earth is endowed already with sanctity, though is that is real, though imperfect. And there you go to the church reflecting on the weakness of the church. The church on earth is endowed already with a sanctity that is real though imperfect. In her members, perfect holiness is something yet to be acquired. Strengthened by so many and such great means of salvation, all the faithful, whether their condition or state, though each in his own way, are called by the Lord to, the, to that perfection of sanctity by which the Father himself is perfect. So just recently, I don't know if you heard on the news, the Holy Father re released a new document, uh, Gaudete Exaltate, you know, rejoice and be glad. It's a, it's a reflection on holiness. And he reminds us again what the Second Vatican Council taught. Every person is called to holiness, not just people in strange outfits that have tongue depressors. Okay? Every single person who is baptized is called to be holy. Yeah, he says be holy in whatever you do, either a parent yep. or not necessarily to a priest or a nun. Yep, that's right. 
I think that means still the, it's been taught for 60 years, but it just doesn't quite, I don't think people can think that they can be holy. I can't be holy. Look what I do. Well, right here, the church is saying, you can be holy. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that's kind of where that is. So if you go then to paragraph 827, that indented paragraph, this is also another good one that helps us understand it. So the church is therefore holy, though having sinners in, the, in her midst because she herself has no other life but the life of grace. Just think about it, no other life but the life of grace. Grace is the life of God given, that's what grace is. The church recognizes the power of spirit of holiness within her and sustains the hope of believers by proposing the saints to them as models and intercessors. The saints have always been the source, oh, I'm actually reading the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> if they live her life, her members are sanctified. If they move away from her life, they fall into sins and disorders that prevent the radiation of her sanctity. I love that phrase. When members of the church do not live sanctity, they prevent the radiation of sanctity. I love that phrase. This is why she suffers and does penance for those offenses of which she has the power to free her children through the blood of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that paragraph there acknowledges that the church is holy and yet sinful. Like for me, I, can I make a confession? Mm -hmm. All right. Can you give me absolution? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my confession is I entered seminary when the sex abuse scandal broke. And my mom said, what are you doing? Like, someone's got to join, mom. <laughs> you know, like, someone's got to turn this ship around here. But how much that deeply wounds and has hurt people. When people who say they're supposed to be ministers and instruments of Christ to do that to other people, you know, that's where it deeply hurts us. That's why we have to make reparation and do penance for those that have done that. So that's for me, I feel like my life is a reparation for all the sins of priests that have taken people away from Christ. Think about that when it comes to marriage. You see a lot of divorce present. If people who are married and live the sacrament of marriage, could they live their marriage in reparation for all those that were unable to be together? That they could be a healing presence within the church by being faithful to their marriage vows. That brings healing into the church. So that's the movement of the holiness of the church. Does that make sense? But some of these phrases, see, you can understand these. What, don't you want to open the book now? Right, Bernie? Here we go. Okay. Let's look at the next one, right? The church is Catholic. Okay? The church is Catholic. I'm going to give that question to you. Don't read. Okay? Don't look at the Baltimore Catechism. Okay. The church is Catholic. What does that mean? One, two, three, go. Talk to one another. Okay, let's all come together. So, let's start with this table. The church is Catholic. What does that mean? Universal. Universal. Okay. Let's do this table. The church is Catholic. What? Universal. Okay. I think we're going to go through here. What's this? The church is Catholic. What does that mean? One for all. One for all. Okay. How about this one? Are you going to say ditto? <laughs> okay, all over. Universal and all over. Okay. All right, good. That's pretty good. You guys kind of know it. So let's talk about it now. Look at 830. What does Catholic mean? The word, it's on the bottom of page four. The word Catholic means universal. And here's, it kind of explains it a little bit. In the sense 
of according to the totality or in keeping with the whole. So there's two senses of the word Catholic. The, Catholic, the church is Catholic in a double sense. First, the church is Catholic because Christ is present in her. Where there is Christ Jesus, there is the Catholic Church. I love that quote. I forgot who said that. 307. I want to know who said that. Who says that? Do you see how you like footnotes? St. Ignatius of Antioch, he was an early church father there, okay? So in her subsists the fullness of Christ's body united with its head. This implies that she receives from him the fullness of the means of salvation, which he has willed, correct and complete confession of faith, full sacramental life, and ordained ministry in the apostolic succession. The church was, in this fundamental sense, Catholic on the day of Pentecost, and will always be so until the day of the Perusia, which means the second coming, okay? So that's the first sense, okay? So we receive Christ. Christ is present, okay, because of those things present. See how they're starting to interrelate with one another? The four marks, how Catholic is starting to inter interrelate with oneness, right? Here's the second one. Secondly, the church is Catholic because she has been sent out by Christ on a mission to the whole of the human race. So here's a quote, let's see who quote it is, 311. So Lumen Gentium, that's a quote from the Second Vatican Council. All men are called to belong to the new people of God. This people therefore for, while remaining one and only one, is to be spread out throughout the whole world and to all ages in order that the design of God's will may be fulfilled. He made human nature one in the beginning and has decreed that all his children who are, were scattered should be finally gathered together as one. The character of, of universality which adorns the people of God is a gift from the Lord himself, whereby the Catholic Church ceaselessly and, efficaci and efficaciously seeks for the, for the return of all humanity and all its goods under Christ the head in the unity of his spirit. That's kind of a thick one, right? Kind of chewing that. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that God wants everyone to be one in relation with him. And it's through his church that he's going to accomplish that. So one of the ways that the church um, is an instrument of unity. So the church is the one that brings the instrument of unity. If, and if you've ever been to a big church event, that's where you really experience that the most. Let me tell you a funny story. I was in St. Peter's Square the first time, and I'm in line to go to evening prayer with Pope John Paul II on New Year's Eve 2004. And I'm walking in there, this big line to get into St. Peter's. And I'm in line, and I see five people that I knew in that line. I'm like, what the? Were they the ones you came with? No. <laughs> There were, I was with a group with my seminary, and there was a group of people from Loris College that I knew. I'm like, I didn't know they were going to be there. And then I go into that church, the Mother Church of Christendom, of, of Christendom, and I am praying the same prayers for everyone here. We're all doing it in one language, Latin. And I'm sitting next to an Argentinian here, uh, African here, an Italian there. And I'm like, wow. This is a universal church, you know? And that's one gift that we have from some of African priests coming over. I think they're more Catholic than we are sometimes. You know, they really have this deep devotion. I'm like, wow. Or I have friends who are from other parts of the world who are now like, that really, you know, what other institution actually does that? To bring everyone from every nation together. That is a miracle in my mind, okay? So let's kind of go on. So each particular church is Catholic. So we're in the Catholic Universal Archdiocese of Dubuque. So each particular church is Catholic with a small c. So look at that paragraph there. Look at 833 there. The phrase particular church, which is the diocese, refers to a community of the Christian faithful in communion of faith and sacraments with their bishop ordained in apostolic succession. These particular churches are constituted after the model of the universal church. It is in these and formed out of them that the one and unique Catholic church exists. So there's multiplicity and oneness within the church. There's the one and the many being present. 
There's one church throughout the world. We all have one shepherd, the Holy Father, who's the vicar of Christ on earth. Yet within that one church, there are many little churches throughout the world. And yet we're all one. So right there, you kind of see there's a mystery there. There's a, a oneness and a duplicity. There's a oneness and a multiplicity that, that we're around. So we're all under the charge of Archbishop Jacobs. If you go over to Wisconsin, you end up being in the Diocese of Madison. The church is split up in that ge geographical way. There are different customs and practices in each of those dioceses, each of those regions, and yet it's still the one universal church throughout the whole world. Um, I don't know, I think that's kind of amazing. What do y'all think? I mean, amen, amen. All right, we should get an amen in church. Okay. All right. Look at uh, the next page, 837. Okay. 837. Okay, fully incorporated in the society of the church are those who possessing the spirit of Christ accept all the means of salvation given to the church altogether with her entire organization and who by the bonds constituted by the profession of faith, the sacraments, ecclesiastical government and communion are joined in the visible structure of the Church of Christ, who rules her through the Supreme Pontiff and the bishops. Even though incorporated into the Church, one does not, however, one who does not, one who does not, however, persevere in charity is not saved. He remains indeed in the bosom of the Church, but in body, not in heart. So that's why you can, you're always a member of the Church, always. If your name is in that baptismal register, doesn't matter what you do for the rest of your life, you are a member of the church. But you can freely choose to walk away from the church. But the church will always claim you. I mean, the you have to do something so bad to be not part of the church anymore. Like, the church won't even almost allow it. So your name in the baptismal register in your parish is the book of life for you. You cannot erase your name out of that book. So that's why we had that book in the fire case safe. <laughs> Other than the Blessed Sacrament, that's the most valuable possession in any parish, is the Blessed Sacrament and the Baptismal Register, because that's the book of life. That's where all your sacraments are given. That's kind of powerful, isn't it? How many books do you have? We have four. Yep, yep, Kathy. And when it says, when you do not preserve and cure, you not Yeah. I would say this, um, what they're referring to in that paragraph is someone who openly, publicly, and from the top of the Empire State Building says, I'm not a Catholic anymore. I mean, publicly, formally saying, I no longer claim to be a member of it. That's what the strict sense of that is. A person who says, I'm a good person, and I don't practice my faith anymore, there's a concern. There's a concern for that person. That's why we pray for them and try to love them back. But it's not referring to that, I don't think. It's referring to someone who says, I hate God and I hate the church now. I don't want to have anything to deal with it. But even that person who I just described, that name will never be taken out of the book. Do you see how the church is? We want everyone to be in the bosom of the church. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, we're almost done. Let's go. We're down to the last one. Uh, let's go to apostolic. So turn the page to page nine. Okay. Let's go to this question now on your own. Don't cheat. Okay. Page nine. The church is apostolic. What does that mean? One, two, three, go. Don't look it up.
Okay, let's all come back. All right, I think we have to start with this table. Okay, it's table number two. So the church is apostolic. What does that mean? Well, we have been calling that chart a while back, and it showed, you know, how the church started. It's the kingdom of the apostles, Christ, and then the apostles. Okay, so we are a church that's connected to the teachings of the apostles. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. From Christ. From Christ. Okay. All right. How about this table over here? What is church is apostolic? What does that mean? Following the apostles' teachings. Okay. Writings. Okay. All right. Okay. Did we do this one? Yeah. Okay. Not this one. Okay. What is the church? Church is apostolic. Founded by the apostles. With Jesus. With Jesus. Okay. Right? Yeah, question. Question. <laughs> Rita? Why is it all we a she. She. No, the church is a she. We'll, we'll learn to get to that. Okay. Right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we have time. How about right here? The church is apostolic. So let's look at this, okay? Here's what it means. Look at 857. All right, everyone look at 857. I'm going to read it. The church is apostolic because she is founded on the apostles in three ways. So here are the three ways. Number one, she was and remains built on the foundation of the apostles. The witnesses chosen and sent on mission by Christ himself. So that's the first one. That's kind of the one you've been all kind of saying. Number two, with the help of the, of the Spirit dwelling in her, the church keeps and hands on the teaching, the good deposit, the salutary words she has heard from the apostles. So what that second one means is that the living voice of the church is still living. It's not a dead letter we are receiving. The same good news that the apostles received is the same good news that is living today that we are being given by the Holy Spirit. So it's not just a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's, it is present. The same newness is present now. Okay? And then number three, she continues to be taught, sanctified, and guided by the apostles into, until Christ's return through their successors in pastoral office. The College of Bishops, assisted by priests in union with the successor of Peter, the church's supreme pastor. So these three things are what it means to be apostolic. There are some Christian churches that have two of these things, one of these things, but we as Catholics say that's not, that's not apostolic. These three things have to be present for it to be apostolic. Because it deals with the living voice, the living voice of the church. So when you see Archbishop Jacobs come in with his pointy hat and his stick of power, they like to call it, right? That is, that is an apostle walking into the church. That's what we believe. A successor of the apostle. So that's why back in the day there was more of this ceremony around a bishop, right? What did you used to do? You used to kiss his ring, right? Mm -hmm. it's to, it, was, it was to remind us that this person is not just any man. He's a successor of the apostle. So that's the whole idea. That's why it's such a big deal for Catholics to meet the Pope. He's the successor of St. Peter. The same chair that Peter sat in is the chair that Francis sits in. I mean, just to think about that. What institution has a leader that consistent down the centuries like that? That has to be the Holy Spirit doing that. So that's what it means then. Okay, so here's, let's, let's get at number... So look at number 858. This gets at something Elaine said. She said we're all apostles. She said we're all apostles. So look at 858. Jesus is the Father's emissary. So think about that. He is the one sent by the Father. From the beginning of his ministry, he called to him those whom he desired. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to preach. That's from the Gospel of Mark. From then on, they would be also be his emissaries. That's where you get the word apostle in Greek. 
In them, Christ continues his own mission. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. That's John 15. The apostles' ministry is the continuation of his ministry. Jesus said to the twelve, he who receives you, receives me. He who receives you, receives me. That's why obedience is so important within the church, because you're receiving the one that the Father sent. And that's why the standard of holiness has to be so high for one who would be in the office of bishop. You just don't send some normal dude. Hopefully the guy's been trained and, and proven that this guy is truly one that could be one that was sent by the Father. And that's kind of amazing. I feel bad for bishops. No wonder they all are like this at the end of their life. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, the burden of that, if you really believe that, which I do, you know. Um, so, 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 so that, that's what that means then. So, so look at 860. In the office of the apostles, there is one aspect that cannot be transmitted, to be the chosen witnesses of the Lord's resurrection, and so the foundation stones of the church. But their own office also has a permanent aspect. Christ promised to remain with them always. The divine mission entrusted by Jesus to them will continue to the end of time since the gospel they hang on is the lasting source of all life for the church. Therefore, the apostles took care to appoint successors. So it's really to guard. If you want to have the most unoriginal job, become a bishop. Because all his job is to do is to pass on the apostolic faith that he's received. That's all he's supposed to do. And to make sure that the church remains committed to charity, which keeps the church together. That's his job. His job is to maintain unity, to foster the growth of holiness, so that the church truly be a sign of light to all the world. That's the purpose of the bishop's job. That's why he has priests to help him. That's why all of us have to live our own vocations within, within the church. So... The church is one holy, catholic, and apostolic, right? So as I say that phrase now to you, as, as, as you hear that phrase, the church is one holy, catholic, and apostolic, does that feel different to you now? All right, so share with one another what feels different, then we'll take Rita's question about why is the church always referred to as a sheep? Okay? All right. So let's kind of talk about how does it feel different to hear that phrase now? The church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. What do you appreciate about it now? One, two, three, go. Okay, let's all come back. So it doesn't have to be by table. What's one thing you appreciate now as you hear the phrase, the church is one holy, one holy Catholic and apostolic? What kind of, how does that phrase strike you now? We're all a part of that and carrying on that. So we're all part. So we're all apostles and part of that. Yeah. That it so, has carried on this long, all the ages and all the term life. Yeah. That the church is still here after all that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? What's one thing that kind of strikes you new? I think it gives us more understanding of those words and deeper you know, knowledge about them, as well as wanting them to explore more. You know? Okay. There's, I'm sure, a lot of Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of beautiful things. Okay. Anyone else? We'll do our last question of what's one takeaway. We'll do that at the end. But let's get to Rita's question. Why, throughout this whole treatment of the church, she's always being called she? Okay? Is that private? Is that private? Okay. Yeah. OK, 
Okay. So let's, let's actually get to this. Okay, when you get to the scriptures beginning with the Song of Songs, if you ever had, if you ever, if you ever want to have red cheeks after reading the Bible, read the Song of Songs. It's it, it's an it's an erotic poem about the relationship between God and Israel, and God is the bride of bridegroom that's seeking the bride, and the bride Israel is seeking to be one with her bride, her bridegroom. And from that beginning, there became this language and this imagery that that. God will wed his people. He will marry his people. So one way to look at the cross is Jesus marrying the human race again. That it was consummated on the, on the cross. That at that moment was the uniting of humanity with God again. So have you ever seen altars that have those four pillars and that big covering over the altar? It's called a Baltacino. Do you ever notice that it kind of looks like a bed? Yeah. It looks like a bed. Yeah. And you know how there used to be kind of drapes to keep the heat in, yeah. right? Do I need to go any farther? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting at that. It's getting at that erotic aspect of God's love. He is so in love with us that he'll do anything to be in communion with us. So then the church then becomes a mother. She becomes a mother. She's the mother of all the faithful. That's why the Blessed Virgin Mary is the icon of the church. The way Mary lives is the way the church should live. So the baptismal font is the womb of the church. It's actually the womb. If you think about it, if you look at it, there's water in it. If you think about a natural womb, babies are swimming in water in their mother's womb. From that, the fruit of the womb comes the children of the church. So have you ever noticed during the Easter Vigil, I don't know if you ever go to the Easter Vigil, there's that part when the priest or the deacon dunks the Easter candle into the font? No, I've never seen that. No. That's actually Facing part. forward. No. So it's, it's, it's actually dunked into the baptismal font. That that's a phallic symbol, everyone. It's Jesus impregnating the church with life. That's what it's supposed to symbolize. So bring your fan when you come to the Easter vision. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> right? I mean, that's the idea. So, so in the book of Revelation, are you going to have nightmares? Well, it's actually beautiful. It's beautiful in the best sense. So in the book of Revelation, how is the church? I'll actually find it. How about we end with that? It's fun to see all of you go red. It's so beautiful. I didn't see it in there, huh? Well, here it is. Oh, it's so beautiful. Here, here. It's a chapter. If you want to go back and read it more, it's chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. It's the end of the Bible. It's so beautiful. So here it is. Then this is John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be always with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the whole order has passed away. Then the one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said, Write these words down, for they are trustworthy and true. He said to me, They are accomplished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give a gift from the spring of life-giving water. The victor will inherit these gifts. I shall be his God, and he will be my son. They're describing a wedding. Look how happy we are at a wedding. That's what heaven's going to be, the consummation of mankind being one with God again. It's going to be awesome. I wish it would happen tomorrow, kind of, to be honest. You know? What? St. John. So St. John, he wrote the book of Revelation, and it's the description of heaven. If you want to have a description of heaven, go read the book of Revelation, the end of it. So it's 
Beautiful. Chapter 21, 22. It's just beautiful. Do you want to be inspired? Beautiful imagery. Isn't that beautiful, what I just read? So, just describing that. Like, oh, no more wailing or crying. I mean, yeah. That's the church triumphant in heaven when God consummates everything. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. So, anyway, uh, any last questions? So that's why she's called she. <laughs> Good question. So when the new catechism came out,